Right. Good evening, um, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for the Mayo Clinic's um, cardiovascular monthly uh, webinar series. Uh, today we'll be talking about the role of mitral valve repair uh, in mitral valve regurgitation. My name is Dr. Nkomo. I'm director of the Valvular Heart Disease Clinic at uh, Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota, joined by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Armar Nagarmi, who's one of our cardiovascular surgeons with expertise in uh, cardiovascular surgery, specifically uh, mitral valve uh, repair, uh, both uh, standard mitral valve repair as well as minimal invasive mitral valve repair. Uh, be sure to submit your questions um, uh, for this uh, webinar on the chat box, and we'll try to get to them um, uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation. So the learning objectives uh, for this webinar to summarize the different etiologies of mitral valve regurgitation, recognize the indications and timing for the treatment of mitral valve regurgitation, determine who is a candidate for mitral valve repair surgery, including minimal invasive surgery, and then review the outcomes of mitral valve uh, repair. Uh, just to take a bird's eye view on valvular heart disease, uh, we know that the uh, Prevalence of valvular heart disease increases significantly with aging, and about 12% of the general population of adults in the United States has some form of left-sided valvular heart disease, and most of that is related to mitral valve uh, regurgitation. This is data from uh, NIH population-based uh, studies. And we know that having uh, valvular heart disease is not good for you, so the survivorship uh, of patients with uh, valvular heart disease is lower than that of expected and of people without uh, valvular heart disease. So having valve disease is not, uh, is not good for you. Uh, we know in general also specifically for mitral valve uh, regurgitation that there's under treatment of valvular heart disease and mitral valve regurgitation. This is data from uh, Olmsted County by uh, Maurice Serrano and colleagues looking at the survival after the diagnosis of isolated moderate or severe mitral valve regurgitation stratified by left ventricular ejection fraction. On the left are those patients with left ventricular ejection fraction below 50%, and on the right, those patients with uh, left ventricular ejection fraction above 50%. Broadly speaking, you can look at this as the patients on the right having maybe primary mitral valve regurgitation, and on the left, those having functional mitral valve regurgitation, and we'll talk about uh, more about uh, about that. But the survivorship of patients with mitral valve regurgitation is less than expected uh, in, the, in the population, both for low ejection fraction and uh, uh, preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. And uh, surprisingly, in Olmsted County too, the rates of intervention for mitral valve regurgitation are quite low when you look at the total population of patients that have mitral valve regurgitation and shown here, the total mitral valve intervention rate with surgery was about 15% for those patients with isolated mitral valve regurgitation. Now, we'll, look, we'll need to look in more detail as far as what the mechanisms of that under-treatment are, uh, but there's gross uh, under-treatment uh, of, uh, of patients with valvular heart disease, specifically here, uh, patients with uh, isolated mitral valve regurgitation. But this is not sort of new uh, data. This is uh, uh, data from the uh, EuroHeart survey showing that uh, surgery was denied in as much as half of the patients with symptomatic uh, mitral regurgitation and that older age and left ventricular dysfunction were the characteristics most strongly associated with the absence of surgery and may be overstressed. So there's delayed uh, uh, referral to intervention uh, for mitral valve regurgitation when patients have, uh, have um, LV uh, dysfunction. So mitral valve regurgitation, when should I intervene and what is the role of mitral valve uh, repair? Well, broadly speaking, when we talk about mitral valve regurgitation, there are two broad categories. One is primary mitral valve regurgitation and then the other is secondary mitral valve regurgitation. And primary or organic mitral valve regurgitation refers to when the problem is that of the mitral valve leaflets or cordy, so the mitral valve apparatus itself, uh, shown here is a flail or a ruptured cord uh, of the uh, one of the mitral valve uh, leaflets. So if you have issues with the leaflets or cords, this would be primary mitral valve regurgitation. Uh, 
And then secondary mitral fibrogenization refers to problems with either the ventricle, where you have ventricular secondary mitral fibrogenization, or problems with the left atrium, where you have atrial uh, mitral fibrogenization. And the mechanism for that ends up being annular dilatation and uh, displacement of your mitral valve uh, uh, apparatus, or so apical and lateral displacement of your mitral valve apparatus from ventricular dilatation and ventricular dysfunction or annular dilatation from atrial enlargement. And this leads to uh, mitral valve regurgitation. So the problem with secondary mitral valve regurgitation is not necessarily the, the, the mitral valve itself, but more the ventricle or the left atrium causing malcorruption of the leaflets and causing secondary mitral valve regurgitation. Now, the role of mitral valve repair, the surgical mitral valve repair, is very well established in primary mitral valve regurgitation, and this is what we'll be uh, talking about uh, uh, um, moving uh, forward when Dr. Argami um, uh, shares his presentation. Now, you need to look at the ideology of mitral valve regurgitation and the mechanism of mitral valve regurgitation because it, ma it matters whether it's primary or secondary mitral valve regurgitation. The severity, is it mild, is it moderate, or is it severe mitral valve regurgitation? And then the acuteness of mitral valve regurgitation. All these things will influence whether you repair or replace the valve and when to intervene. So this is uh, an outline of the uh, distribution of mitral valve regurgitation. Again, data from uh, Dr. Serrano and colleagues looking at the uh, distribution of functional versus organic or primary mitral valve regurgitation. So when you look at all comers of mitral valve regurgitation, most of them end up being functional mitral valve regurgitation, and then a substantial proportion will be organic or primary mitral valve regurgitation. Again, for functional, it's a ventricular problem or atrial issue. And then for organic mitral valve regurgitation, the bulk of organic mitral valve regurgitation is related to degenerative mitral valve uh, uh, disease or mitral valve prolapse or flail uh, leaflet. So uh, most of the time when we talk about organic mitral valve regurgitation, we're referring to degenerative uh, mitral valve regurgitation. So here's a case of a 56-year-old female with known mitral valve prolapse who uh, actually had planned to have her mitral valve intervened upon. She had asymptomatic severe mitral valve regurgitation but uh, developed sudden onset of dyspnea and a non-productive cough, not responding to z -pack because initially we thought she had bronchitis or the primary thought she had bronchitis or pneumonia. Shown here is unilateral uh, pulmonary edema on the right side. So she was asymptomatic and then suddenly became uh, uh, dyspneic and was found to have unilateral pulmonary edema. Now the problem with her was uh, rupture uh, of one of the cords to the posterior mitral valve leaflet, which resulted in significant mitral valve regurgitation, eccentric jets with this mitral regurgitation directed towards the right-sided pulmonary veins, which is why she ended up with this unilateral pulmonary edema. Now, we tell most of our patients with mitral valve prolapse that you need to be aware of this potential complication. So when there's um, when there's a decline in functional status or sudden onset, acute shortness of breath, that this may be the issue. And if this is confused with a pulmonary uh, process, the outcomes may be uh, less than desired. So just make sure you tell your patients with uh, mitral valve prolapse that this may be a potential complication. It's not uh, a common, common complication, but it may, it may occur. Uh, the patient underwent mitral valve repair because this is what you want to do when a patient has primary mitral valve regurgitation is you want to repair the valve instead of uh, replace, uh, replace the valve. Uh, this is a study uh, from an institution looking at the prevalence and characteristics and outcomes of patients presenting with cardiogenic uh, unilateral pulmonary edema. And uh, all of these patients with this unilateral pulmonary edema in this particular series were related to uh, mitral valve regurgitation, so acute, severe mitral valve regurgitation causing unilateral pulmonary edema. So just be aware of that entity. Here's a different patient. This is more related to coronary artery disease, had a focal myocardial infarction, and had uh, papillary muscle uh, rupture associated with severe mitral valve regurgitation. 
This was initially confused for potentially, uh, I think, endocarditis because there was a, a mass uh, seen in association with the mitral valve. But this is actually popular has uh, popular popular head, um, and uh, you should not uh, confuse this for for endocarditis. And the patient uh, needed uh, surgery. This patient underwent mitral valve uh, replacement, but the valve could have been repaired uh, if possible. And for these particular patients, either way, I think mitral valve repair or replacement, as long as you fix the uh, mitral valve. And this is um, just a review of uh, patients uh, from, from Mayo Clinic who underwent uh, mitral valve surgery for um, acute papillary muscle uh, rupture. So acute severe mitral valve regurgitation ends up being an emergency, caudal rupture, papillary uh, muscle rupture, uh, cases of infective endocarditis can be uh, can result in acute uh, severe mitral valve regurgitation, acute hypertension. Uh, we've seen some patients with acute hypertension presenting with severe mitral valve regurgitation, or dynamic left ventricular flow tract obstruction from apical ballooning or takosubo. Uh, or uh, apical uh, infarct with a hyperdynamic base. Uh, so these can be all uh, causes of uh, severe acute mitral valve regurgitation. But of course, the treatment uh, for some of them is mitral valve surgery, and for some, uh, you treat, uh, for instance, the hypertension or uh, try to reduce the obstruction, the dynamic LVOT uh, obstruction. Now, chronic mitral valve regurgitation is more common than um, uh, acute severe mitral valve uh, regurgitation, uh, whether we're talking about primary mitral valve regurgitation or functional uh, mitral valve regurgitation. So we'll turn our attention now to a primary, again, primary uh, mitral valve regurgitation because our webinar is focused on uh, a primary uh, mitral valve uh, repair. Uh, this is a, a cartoon presentation of myxomatous mitral valve disease, uh, shown here is a ruptured cord to the posterior mitral valve leaflet. Uh, just an example of severe um, mitral valve disease. And the mitral valve um, uh, regurgitation may be variable depending on the degree of mitral valve prolapse and whether there's uh, a flail or not. But what determines outcomes in these patients is the degree of mitral valve regurgitation. And when it's severe, it impacts on uh, life expectancy and survivorship. Now, um, with the onset of mitral valve uh, regurgitation, if it's chronic, you may remain or your patient may remain asymptomatic for a very uh, long time. But during that uh, um, uh, time period before the onset of symptoms, there's progressive LV dilatation because you're compensating for that volume uh, overload, but you don't have an infinite capacity for uh, compensation and, and that LV dilatation at some point becomes abnormal and you have LV, uh, severe LV dilatation and LV systolic dysfunction and you may have this uh, um, be present before the onset of uh, symptoms. And what you need to uh, remember is that once there is uh, LV dysfunction, the prognosis is poor with or without uh, an operation. So here's an example of a patient, a 46-year-old uh, runner, runs uh, six miles most days uh, of the week. His uh, significant other heard a murmur um, when she was giving him a hug and said, you need to go in and see someone. And sure enough, the patient had uh, mitral valve um, uh, regurgitation from uh, a posterior mitral valve leaflet prolapse and flail associated with severe uh, mitral valve uh, regurgitation. Now, the patient was uh, asymptomatic, and if he had any symptoms, it was very uh, minimally symptomatic, um, and he came in to see us. Chest X-ray shown here really doesn't show any significant cardiomegaly, and the electrocardiogram was, uh, was unremarkable. And so uh, the echocardiogram uh, diagnosed flail posterior mitral valve leaflet, severe mitral valve regurgitation with an effective regurgitant orifice of 60 uh, square millimeter, uh, anything above 40 square millimeter is severe regurgitation, and the regurgitant volume here was more than 100 milliliters. The left ventricular end diastolic dimension was 71 millimeter, left ventricular end systolic dimension 42, 
and the ejection fraction was preserved at 69%. Uh, and because a patient is asymptomatic, you may ask yourself, well, what do you do? Continue with observation, exercise stress test, cardiac uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, repair or replace the, the mitral valve, and we opted for number four to repair the uh, mitral valve. So um, what is the natural history of mitral regurgitation? If you take flay leaflets as the model of a severe mitral valve regurgitation, primary uh, mitral valve regurgitation, uh, again, this is data from Dr. Serrano that shows you have excess mortality in those patients with severe mitral valve regurgitation from flay leaflets. Excess mortality uh, compared to expected uh, uh, survival. And most of that uh, poor survival is driven by people with class 3 or class 4 symptoms. And we used to wait uh, a while back for class 3 or class 4 symptoms before intervening on these patients. Um, and the survivorship is better, obviously, in those patients with class 1 or class 2 symptoms. Uh, but we know that even amongst these patients, there are patients at higher risk uh, who would benefit from earlier repair rather than late repair. So we don't wait anymore until the patient is class three or class four uh, symptoms. But um, uh, if you do see a patient uh, with that, uh, that, that uh, is associated with a very poor uh, survivorship. Uh, the natural history of mitral valve regurgitation is also influenced by the left ventricular ejection fraction. So those patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 60% do not do as well as those patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction above uh, 60%. So uh, symptoms and uh, low ejection fraction, uh, the cutoff being 60%, uh, are prognosticators. And this is data also showing that left ventricular and systolic dimension uh, influences the natural history of mitral valve regurgitation, where your survivorship is uh, impaired or poor if the left ventricular and systolic dimension is 40 millimeter or more. Uh, LV uh, and systolic dimension of four a centimeter is an independent predictor of overall mortality, cardiac mortality, and even excess mortality following an operation. So you want to do an operation in someone with uh, left, ventri uh, left ventricle and systolic dimension uh, 40 uh, millimeter or less. Uh, other prognosticators include uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this is data from uh, International Registry looking at uh, uh, prognosticators in patients with degenerative or primary mitral valve regurgitation and uh, pulmonary systolic pressure or presence of pulmonary hypertension is associated with um, increased mortality or poor survivorship in all comers and those under medical therapy and even after surgery. And so if you wait until your uh, pulmonary pressures are above 50% or, or 50 millimeters of mercury, where the patient has pulmonary hypertension, then the patients do not do as well when you do the operation compared to patients who, uh, who do not have pulmonary hypertension uh, before the uh, operation. Now, again, data from uh, Dr. Serrano uh, that showed that even in asymptomatic uh, patients with degenerative or primary mitral valve regurgitation, uh, the natural history really is determined by the severity of uh, regurgitation. So shown here, uh, the grading is the grading scheme of mild regurgitation being an ERO less than uh, 20, moderate mitral valve regurgitation, and then severe uh, mitral valve regurgitation with the effective regression orifice of 40 uh, a square a millimeter. So patients with uh, severe uh, mitral valve regurgitation with uh, effective regression orifice of 40 a square millimeter uh, do worse than patients with less degrees of mitral valve uh, regurgitation. And so these are the patients that um, we'd like to uh, operate on uh, early because of this poor uh, survivorship. Uh, so when do you operate? Uh, we like to operate early in primary mitral valve uh, regurgitation, suitable pathology, and Dr. Agarma will talk more about that. If a patient has severe mitral valve regurgitation and the cutoff for, for uh, severe um, uh, mitral regurgitation, again, effective regurgitation orifice of uh, 40, 
um, square millimeter or 0 0.4 square centimeter and a regurgitation volume of 60 milliliters per beat. If a patient has symptoms, if the left ventricular and systolic dimension is 40 millimeter or left ventricular ejection fraction begins to fall below 60%, in fact, the current guidelines say you don't have to wait until the ejection fraction falls below 60%, but on its way to 60% on uh, serial imaging, you may want to consider uh, uh, doing an operation. And then right ventricular systolic pressure elevation, atrial fibrillation, left atrial enlargement, and elevated NT pro BNP are other uh, markers of increased uh, risk of uh, mortality uh, in these patients. Now, not infrequently, we run into patients whose presentation is mainly uh, arrhythmias, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, uh, in the setting of mitral valve uh, prolapse. And these patients may have varying degrees of mitral valve regurgitation. They don't have to have severe uh, mitral valve regurgitation, but the presence of mitral uh, valve prolapse uh, is associated with, uh, with uh, ventricular arrhythmias. So here's a case of a 34-year-old female with um, uh, mitral valve prolapse and occasional palpitations. Holter monitor shows ventricular ectopy, 1% uh, of the total beats, and a short, bin, short beat run of uh, non-sustained uh, VT. And the patient had exercise ECG, and the ventricular arrhythmias uh, worsened uh, with uh, uh, exercise. And fortunately, in her case, uh, this did respond to a beta blockade uh, with a reduction in the burden of her ventricular ectopy and palpitations when she was uh, put on beta blockers. But this was the echocardiogram basically showing bileaflet mitral valve uh, prolapse, uh, severe prolapse here. But the degree of regurgitation for her was only in the moderate range. Uh, here, um, mildly eccentric jets uh, directed posteriorly, which are quantitated more in the uh, moderate range, uh, but she had uh, pretty significant uh, ectopy with, uh, with exercise. And fortunately, it responded well to, uh, to beta blockers. Now, the patients, uh, you can identify uh, uh, those at risk of this ventricular ectopy with this uh, late systolic spike on uh, tissue Doppler imaging of the uh, lateral uh, annulus, uh, termed uh, pickle hub uh, by uh, Dr. Tajik and colleagues. Um, but this uh, late systolic spike basically is evidence of uh, a very marked annular uh, displacement, pulling on the uh, papillary muscles by this uh, extensive uh, prolapse and um, which can be associated with scar formation on the papillary muscles or the base of the ventricular septum and, uh, and be a genesis for these, uh, for these uh, arrhythmias. Uh, most of the time, the patients with mitral valve prolapse that have rhythm issues uh, have uh, this mitral annular disjunction, basically where the uh, posterior mitral valve leaflet inserts uh, atrially, more in the atrium, than on the annulus. So mitral annular disjunction uh, is one uh, uh, entity that you need to be aware of that occurs in about 30% of these patients with primary mitral valve uh, um, uh, disease uh, that uh, is associated with, uh, with ventricular arrhythmias. The overall survival in patients with mitral annular uh, disjunction is, is as good as those without mitral annular disjunction but there just is a uh, higher uh, incidence of, uh, of ventricular uh, arrhythmias in these patients. And so this, this is something that we need to be, uh, just need to be uh, aware of. And then I'll turn it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Garmi, to tell us more about um, uh, mitral valve repair uh, in these patients with uh, primary mitral valve regurgitation. Dr. Garmi? Thank you. Yep. Thanks, uh, Dr. Nakomo. Um, uh, I have no relevant financial disclosures to this talk. So um, I hope Dr. Nakomo has convinced you that uh, early uh, surgery is indicated for primary organic mitral valve uh, uh, regurgitation. I'm going to show you this case uh, just so we can follow along. This, I'll present this case all the way through the, the end of the slides. This is a 65-year-old male who presents with exertional dyspnea, class 2, has severe mitral valve regurgitation with posterior leaflet prolapse, EF is 
that has new onset atrial fibrillation. There are a couple of things in that uh, you know, description, if you remember stuff that Dr. Nakomo mentioned in terms of indication that will qualify this patient for uh, repair surgery. Now, this is the AHA guideline uh, from 2020. Uh, Dr. Nakomo explained every aspect of it pretty well, uh, but I just wanted to summarize it in one, you know, one thing if you could remember, and that is if you have primary organic mitral valve re severe mitral valve regurgitation, uh, as long as you can have a successful repair, you have at least a class 2A indication for repair. So there's no need for waiting for anything, as long as you have a center that can provide adequate repair with a good success rate and low mortality. Now, we talked about all the aspects of a repair, but what does a repair actually look like and mean? This is uh, Dr. Dwight Magoon, uh, one of the pioneers of cardiac surgery, who had his first uh, repair of a mitral valve ruptured cordy published in 1958 here at Mayo Clinic. And his description has been the basis of many of the current uh, methods of repairing mitral valve. Uh, using uh, similar methods based on his technique, we've been able to repair more than 8,000 uh, mitral valves uh, successfully. Now, this study I like uh, shows that you know when you repair a mitral valve, uh, sometimes people ask why not to replace, uh, but the durability of the repair, especially if you're repairing a posterior leaflet prolapse, is so good, it's even better than a mechanical valve, so keep that in mind. We have done so with such a low risk. Uh, risk of mortality is about 0.4%, and if you only look at patients who were in class one or two, uh, that mortality is less than one in a thousand. So in, in, in short, the, the repair techniques uh, include the one that Mayo Clinic uh, has uh, you know, been working with uh, all these years is it usually involves a resection. So this picture shows a flail leaflet, posterior leaflet. We do resect this, we call it a triangular resection to get rid of the area that uh, includes the flail segment. And then we repair that uh, with non-absorbable sutures, as you can see here. And then most all these patients get an annuloplasty, which we use a flexible posterior partial band uh, to basically uh, stabilize the, the valve and, and brings the leaflets closer to each other so they meet more effectively in the middle with better coaptation and uh, longer durability. Now, sometimes, especially when the anterior leaflet is involved, uh, we avoid resection and we use artificial cords, uh, which are made of Gore-Tex material, um, and uh, replace the ruptured cords instead of resecting. Now, we took all that vast and you know experience in mitral valve repair and open technique and brought it to the 21st century and applied the robotic technique to it. Um, that allowed us to go from an incision that was in a sternotomy, usually pretty large incision, to only a few dots of holes on the side of the chest. I'm going to show you a, a brief operation that's done robotically. This is what happens in a robotic operating room. Um, this is the uh, robotic console that one of the surgeons sits at, and the patient is over here, and then you can see the robotic arms in that corner. This is the cardiopulmonary bypass machine that it's used. Patient is positioned in a supine position and it's draped appropriately. And then here's when the robot is basically docked. Now, what do I mean by robot and the console? This is what it looks like. One of the surgeons sits at the console, moves these basically joysticks uh, that are uh, attached uh, electronically to these robotic arms and they move accordingly in the bedside. They have tiny little hands inside that will uh, perform, perform the procedure for you. Now, before I show you the video, I wanted to bring this slide up. You remember this case, the patient had atrial, new onset atrial fibrillation. Now, there are many randomized clinical trials that have shown that concomitant surgical atrial fibrillation ablation improves freedom from AFib in the future. And also, most of you are aware of the recent uh, Laos 3, 3 trial that showed that occlusion of the left atrial appendage in patients with history of AFib reduces the risk of uh, stroke. So we 
we perform this for this patient as well. So this is the video. Basically, uh, this is uh, an opening in the left atrium. So we go inside the heart. We, uh, the heart is already arrested. The first thing we do, we inspect the valve. This part is the anterior leaflet, and this part is the posterior leaflet. You remember this patient had flail. You can see those cord kind of ruptured. We're using the scissors. These are the robotic arms, uh, cutting that part in a triangular pie-shaped uh, fashion, as, as you can see here. Now, because this patient required uh, atrial fibrillation ablation, at this point, we switch gears uh, and perform the ablation. This is a probe that gets cold and, and, and uh, freezes the atrial tissue that kills that atrium and creates a, basically a box around the areas that most commonly are the source of atrial fibrillation. So basically, it boxes all the abnormal signals in, preventing them from propagating through the rest of the heart. That's so called a, a maze procedure. And uh, we do this, um, uh, and uh, we connect it to the mitral annulus, which is the, uh, the standard uh, way of performing this. And at the end, we'll close the atrial appendage, and I'll show you that. Now we go back to the leaflet. We're going to repair that pie-shaped resection that we performed. We use non-absorbable chlorine suture, as you can see in this uh, video. That's a running uh, proline suture. Here we skip through a little bit, and... Uh, and at the end, we're going to tie that down. Uh, this allows for the leaflet to be more stabilized. There's no you know, major prolapse anymore. And that flail portion has been taken out. Now, to stabilize this, we add a flexible band and suture that to the annulus. You can see that this part is the atrium, and that part is the leaflet, and the band goes between the two. The band is made of you know, medical degree fabric, basically, and, and, and it incorporates into the body, has very, very low risk of infection, uh, and um, uh, there's usually no complication related to that. We're using titanium clips to secure the val uh, band in place. And before... We finish and close up. We test the valve with, with uh, basically cold saline in a static fashion. Obviously, the heart is not beating, so it's not the final decision, but at least it gives us an idea of how well the valve uh, is, uh, is working. Right now, you can see that the valve is closed with water behind it. The suture line over here from the, the repair is pretty visible. The band is around. Posteriorly, and I poking at it, you can see there's water pressurized behind it. And we're very satisfied with this repair. We're going to switch gears and go and uh, close the left atrial appendage. We do that by oversewing it from inside. So this is the opening of the left atrial appendage from inside the left atrium. We sew that shut basically using a non absorbable suture. And we do that in two layers just for added security. So this patient got the valve repaired, had an atrial fibrillation ablation performed, and now has the appendage being closed to reduce the risk of strokes. So one of the benefits of surgery over other techniques is that you can provide many procedures in once uh, and, and treat many things uh, at once. <clears throat> This is postoperative uh, imaging. Uh, on the left, you see the intraop TEE that looks good. Then we continue finishing the surgery. And then the, the one on the left is a TTE that's done before patient dismissal. Using the robotic platform, we've done more than 1,000 mitral valve repairs successfully since 2008. Uh, we have had no conversions to sternotomy for mitral repairs. There have been uh, the major complication rate is uh, point, less than 0.5%. And then early reoperation happened in less than 1% as well. We've shown that you can apply the robotic technique to any valve pathology. So anterior leaflet prolapse, 
flail, posterior leaflet, barlows. Um, um, even we have done this for uh, endocarditis patient in select patients. So, so there is very little limitation in, the, in terms of the valve pathology. Remember, we're talking about primary uh, organic mitral valve disease. We also shown that the survival is great, as Dr. Nakoma pointed out. These we can bring back the survival to near normal, uh, as if the patient never had mitral valve regurgitation. The freedom from reoperation is excellent at ten years; is ninety four percent. These are also other beneficial findings that ejection fraction seems to recover after surgery up to two years. You can see the EF initially drops, and then it improves back to near normal at uh, around two years. Similarly, other cardiac indices like LV and diastolic dimension, LV and systolic dimension, they all improve up to two years post-surgery. So we put these patients on ACE inhibitors to help with reverse remodeling and getting them back to uh, a, a normal shape heart. The left atrium does the same thing, same thing as uh, pulmonary artery pressure. Another benefit of the robotic technique is these patients use less narcotic pain medicines, and we all know the, the detriments uh, of using those. Um, so the blue line is, is your robotic patient group, and the, or the, the red one is the sternotomy patient. So to summarize, the benefits of the robotic approach is you have shorter ICU stays, almost half. You have a shorter hospital stay, almost half as well. You have less blood transfusions, and less atrial fibrillation risk post-op. You use less opioid, as I mentioned, and you have faster return to work almost half the time. So to conclude, I want to reiterate what Dr. Nakomo mentioned. In degenerative mitral valve disease with severe regurgitation, early surgical repair should be considered strongly. Mitral valve repair can bring survival amongst those patients to almost near normal. And robotic surgery is an alternative to open sternotomy approach and can be applied to any type of valve disease and provides benefits of shorter hospital stays and recovery and lower complication rate. With that, I would like to conclude and thank you. And I hope you've had a chance to put the questions in the Q&A and uh, go back to Dr. Nakomo. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, data with us. Pretty uh, impressive. Um, so we have a question about um, the differences in repairing the posterior mitral valve leaflet versus the anterior mitral valve leaflet and why you're okay resecting maybe the posterior leaflet but not so much the anterior leaflet. Yeah, so uh, anterior leaflet is less forgiving than the posterior leaflet in terms of uh, repairing it. Uh, that's why resection is usually not the solution uh, when, when we're dealing with anterior mitral leaflet problems. Um, uh, the posterior leaflet, because of the uh, the shape of it, the shorter uh, height, and and the way it sits, uh, it allows for resection, and and that's why we tend to use resection for the posterior leaflet, okay. and and course for the anterior. Now you talked about the advantages of robotic uh, mitral valve repair. Um, so the obvious question would be, of the patients with primary mitral valve regurgitation that come to us to the valve clinic wanting a robot, who are, who are the patients that are not good candidates for robotic mitral valve repair? Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the money question. <laughs> so uh, as, as we kind of briefly mentioned it in there, the valve pathology doesn't dictate whether they're a robotic candidate or not. It's the things around it. Mm. One of the limitations is that we cannot do cabbage, perhaps, uh, for example, alongside the mitral valve. So if the patient has coronary disease that requires cabbage plus mitral valve, then that has to be done uh, through a sternotomy. Combined valves, most of them can be done robotically. Like mm -hmm. if you have mitral and tricuspid valve regurgitation, or if you have mitral tricuspid, you, have, you need maze procedure. We just saw an example of that. Those can all be robotically done. Now, and the other uh, things, because these patients have to be, be placed on cardiopulmonary bypass through the groin, we need the peripheral vasculature to be in a reasonable shape. Mm. So if you have severe peripheral arterial disease, that also precludes you from being a robotic candidate. Mm. So those are the main, uh, uh, main, ones. main yeah. ones. There are a few body habitus uh, 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 conditions that can preclude you from having surgery, but those are 
Plus Those are the main ones. Important, yeah. So some patients will come to us in the valve clinic and say, look, I've already had a stenotomy once for something, and now I need my mitral valve operated on. It looks like it's repairable. Uh, if you've had surgery before, is that a problem for the robot? Not an automatic uh, turn down. Okay. Uh, depends on what type of surgery, what kind of access was done before, whether the right prole space has been violated or not. One of the things that we need in, in robotic mitral valve uh, surgery is to, we go through the right side and we have to deflate the right lung. Now, if the patient had previous lung surgery on the right, for example, or if they had open heart surgery perhaps more than once that requires entering into the right pole space, that creates a lot of scar tissue mm -hmm. and that may preclude. So in a redo setting is more of a, you know, a per patient decision making of what has been done before and mm -hmm. whether it can be done again. Okay. But it's not an automatic turn down. No, no, no. Okay, that's good to know. So have have um and I know I've I've done this maybe on one or two occasions, referred patients to cardiovascular surgery for mitral valve repair, primarily for the arrhythmia issues. But I mean it's rare for me to consider this. And I don't know if in your practice, uh, some of our colleagues are sending patients for you, primarily for this uh, rhythm, ventricular ectopy, non-sustained VT indications to repair the valve because right. the patient has mitral inner disjunction and... Right, right. Um, I would say, kind of like the case you presented, most of the time when they are referred for surgery, there is at least some mitral regurgitation. Mm -hmm. It might not be mm -hmm. severe. Right. The other thing is that, you know, doing ablation at the same time, this has been discussed. We've, you know, we work very closely with the EP group and either ablating the papillary head, which has been described and we've offered that, or ablating uh, a mitral uh, hinge, basically posterior mitral valve annulus mm. uh, for potentially get rid of, uh, getting rid of these um, abnormal signals. Mm. So yes, that can be done. Okay. But a lot of times there is at least some mitral regurgitation to, to justify, to justify that. that. Otherwise, yeah. if it's purely uh, uh, elect you know, uh, an ectopic a PVC or, or arrhythmia, sometimes you can get percutaneous ablation for it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've uh, looked at some of our experience with these patients with um, uh, a rhythmic uh, mitral valve prolapse, and mitral valve repair doesn't uniformly eliminate these arrhythmias. So there's usually additional stuff that you have to do for the, for the rhythm, uh, like an ablation or antiarrhythmic therapies and, and so forth. Um, and so just repairing the mitral valve, while, you know, in a few cases, it seems to help. That doesn't seem to be the only thing that you need to do for these for these particular cases. Um, now, I, in um, and I know we were talking about primary mitral valve regurgitation. Um, so, for the patients, obviously, that are not robotic candidates, you would go for the regular stenotomy. Um, and then, as far as uh, pain wise, uh, because some of the uh, what I hear is that maybe the minimal invasive uh, surgery may be more painful, but you spend less time in the hospital and you recover quicker, as you showed in the use of pain medications. But what's the the, the difference in, in that? So that, that's another good question. So it's um, it's a little different. You saw the slides that the patients who had robotic surgery use less pain medication, mm -hmm. but that we haven't shown that completely translates into less perception of pain, you know, okay. just because you use less pain medication, it probably means that you have less pain, but, but because the pain charts are a subjective number that the patients give, it's hard to show that they actually felt less pain. Mm. Um, what I tell my patients is that because this recovery is so quick, you're literally only in the hospital for three days, and most of our patients leave the hospital on no narcotic pain medications, mm -hmm. and they are taking only mm -hmm. Tylenol. Mm -hmm. So your pain will go away within three days, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 it's less pain. We use some local anesthetics during surgery that helps with the pain in the first 12 to 24 hours. Um, I would not tell them that you have less pain. I would mm -hmm. say this is a very quick recovery, and by the time you leave the hospital, 
you, your pain will be Absolutely. substantially subsided. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you showed some very uh, convincing data as far as the potential complications of robotic mitral valve repair. Fantastic results with with the surgery, and um, and I think you said you get the same basically you get the same surgery as you would okay. with a regular open uh, sternotomy. Uh, what are the, some of the uh, maybe unique complications to to robotic mitral valve repair because as, I mean the instrumentation is different the mm -hmm. procedure itself is different while you don't have a lot of complications but some patients want to know, you right. know what may or may not happen so you know. so the only difference is I would say is because we have to again put these patients on cardiopulmonary bypass through the groin they get a small incision in their groin. In theory, you can get complications from a groin. They can get a little seroma or fluid collection in the groin. Very rarely, about you know, less than 1% of patients get that. When you have a sternotomy, you don't have an incision in your groin. So uh, in theory, you won't get any of, that, any of that. At the same time, when you have a sternotomy, uh, one of the biggest complications that a sternotomy patient get is sternal wound infection which can be devastating, although rare, but you can get it. Mm. But when you're doing it through the thoracotomy or small incisions, that's, again, completely uh, you know, non-existent because mm. there is really no incision on the sternum. So there are some trade-offs that you get a different type of complication potentially, but the risk of complications are quite lower. We saw the com comparative complications like blood transfusion. Blood transfusion is not a benign thing. Mm -hmm. And because we do this very minimally invasive, there's less tissue trauma. They don't require as, uh, they don't lose as much blood and they don't require as much blood transfusion. Similarly, because the manipulation of the heart is minimized, we see a lot less atrial fibrillation post-op mm -hmm. in this population mm -hmm. as compared mm -hmm. to sternotomy patients. Sternotomy. So now, I mean, we talk a lot about early repair before the ventricle gets too big, before the left ventricle ejection fraction falls below a certain uh, level. Um, um, are there sort of uh, limits to how much LV dysfunction or size before you consider open versus robotic repair when it comes to some of the sequelae of mitral regurgitation? Good question again, but th there's no specific cutoff. Mm -hmm. It's not like I can, you know, I'll tell you if right. you're right. in systolic dimension is 45 or more, we won't have to do it. Mm -hmm. It's case by case. You've seen ventricles seven centimeter and the patient was a runner or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so th it's it's more into context. Mm -hmm. But yes, if there is severe uh, LV dysfunction, uh, it's usually safer to do this uh, in an open fashion just because we have more control. Mm -hmm. It's not a complete contraindication. We go mm -hmm. case by case. But but in general, I, I agree with you. And you, there's severe dysfunction when you need to do other things. If you probably need to put the patient on ECMO or other things, uh, you have a little bit more control when it's open. Mm. And then um, talk to us just in general um, uh, about uh, recurrent mitral valve regurgitation after successful repair. So we tried to look at this and found that, I mean, you know, the, your colleagues have also looked at this, um, saying that uh, primary, the, the progression of the patient's primary disease is probably what determines mm -hmm recurrent mitral valve regurgitation uh, most of the time. Um, and, um, and you already mentioned that a re-repair or redo surgery with a robot is, is doable. What, what is your approach to, to re-operating on someone with, um, with recurrence of, of, of mitral valve regurgitation after a successful repair? So that uh, a lot depends on, on, as you mentioned, the mechanism of recurrence. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the things that can be re-repaired, basically, are, are an obvious failure of the previous surgery. I get patients referred sometimes when the band that was placed has dehessed for mm -hmm. some reason or one or the other, or detached from what it was connected. Um, or if the initial technique was, you know, a, a different technique that was, you know, wasn't adequate, or if the progression of the primary disease is in a, such a way that it still allows us to repair the second time. Mm -hmm. Now, the rates of 
re-repair are a lot lower than our primary. So mm. um, when you have primary mitral valve regurgitation, the rate of repair repairability is 98, 99% chance. Mm. When we have a re-repair technique, that number falls into 50% or even lower sometimes. Mm. Mm. So it all depends on, on what the etiology of the re-regurgitation is mm. and what was done the first surgery. If there was leaflet resection or not, whether it was cords used or not, mm. and, and what kind mm. of band was used. Is it a recurrence of MR or is it now stenotic? Mm. So those all play into it. Play into it, yeah. So the videos you showed and the graphics of seeing uh, at, from Mayo and being here for all this time looking at, at how you guys do mitral valve repair, there seems to be sort of a, a standard way, at least for that annuloplasty band. Um, and I've seen sort of, you know, bands that you can staple, uh, bands that you, you know, uh, complete rings, rigid yeah. ones, and, yeah. and all of that. But but we seem to, at least you seem to use a, a certain type of annuloplastic band. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about yeah, sort of what the... Sure, sure. And, you know, we, we, we usually say that, you know, we repair the valves in a very similar fashion. But mm -hmm. I like to say this is more of an art. You know, you, you've seen it. You mm -hmm. know, every valve is different. You right, look at the echo, right. it's, it, everyone has a different pathology. So in principle, they're all repaired the same way. Mm -hmm. um, most of them get a resection. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them get a band. Mm -hmm. um, so, but every single patient, where to cut, how much to cut, how much to fold, how much to tie, suture, where, how far you pull up the band, what mm -hmm. size band you use. Now, in terms of the band specifically, we believe in the flexible band because mm -hmm. there's, as you mentioned, two types of band, flexible mm -hmm. and rigid. The mitral annulus, and this has been more and more uh, proven to be, it's a dynamic structure. Mm -hmm. It's not a, you know, it's not a fixed valve. It, it's a fixed uh, object. Uh, and it does participate in, in, the, in the cardiac cycle. So we prefer a flexible band that allows the annulus to be fluid. Mm -hmm. um, we use a partial band because we've shown that only the posterior portion of the annulus is the part that expands. Mm -hmm. The, the anterior portion, which is we call the intertrigonal distance, because it's made of fibrous tissue, it doesn't expand. So mm -hmm. on, on, on studies that you're well aware of, mm -hmm. uh, we've shown that any mitral valve regurgitation, the only part that dilates is actually the posterior. So we only mm -hmm. need to fix that part. We don't really need to, to, to bridge the gap anteriorly. Mm -hmm. So that's why we use a partial and we use a flexible band. Okay. No, that makes sense. And then when it comes to post-repair um, anticoagulation, um, I know this has been an area of some uh, development in terms of what you do after you repair the valve. Or uh, What is your standard practice when it comes to that? So uh, as of now, we use uh, some sort of anticoagulation for a short period of time. Um, the standard right now is we put them on, on a new, uh, one of the newer anticoagulant uh, medications for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. And then they, if they don't have any AFib history, they can come off of that. Okay. Um, I think at some point uh, it was in, studied that whether they need something or not, and this has been debated multiple times back and forth, um, whether to do only aspirin, whether to do Coumadin, or use the, the, the NOAX. And, and aspirin alone seems to be not the right answer. Mm -hmm. And between warfarin or the NOAX, the NOAX are, are easier to use. So we, easy we go with that. Use, yeah. um, and then you also mentioned that you can do double valve mm -hmm. surgery mm -hmm. with, the, with the robot. Yep. Okay. Yep. We can do mitral and tricuspid, which usually they go hand in hand. You mm -hmm. have a you know, severe MR, you usually get uh, tricuspid regurgitation, if, especially if you let it go for long. You get pulmonary hypertension, and then you get the TR. Uh, and, and then we are experimenting with uh, aortic valve and mitral at the same time as well. Mm. So you've done some, some robotic surgery uh, on the There's aortic a, valve as yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, be sure to submit uh, your questions uh, if, you, if you have any uh, before we uh, wrap it up in about uh, five minutes here.
Uh, this has been an interesting educational session for me, uh, for me as well. Thank you Thank for you. for uh, sharing all this uh, information. Um, and so the other question I had was about um, uh, availability of of um, uh, robotic uh, the robot basically. Um, if that sort of uh, I mean, if you want a robot, you can get a robot, or is there some preparation ahead of time that you need to do for that? And there is. So everybody needs a, a, an imaging. We uh, we usually get a, a, a CAT scan or CT scan. As I mentioned, you want to make sure they don't have any severe peripheral arterial disease. Uh, so they need to get that. And then the robot availability, yes, it's a little bit on high demand, mm -hmm. as, as you can expect. So uh, there's a small wait time, but... Um, we're working on every aspect. Uh, the whole uh, department is, uh, you know, geared towards making sure that we have, uh, we can answer to our, our our patients in a timely manner. Okay, uh, this might take a little bit. So one of our um, attendees sort of missed the uh, robot uh, part. Um, uh, they said it's a it's a miracle, uh, but what was the approach? You said it avoided stenotomy. So can you just briefly describe again? Uh, sure. So so the robotic approach, and so I, I may have just glanced quickly over it. It it does not require sternotomy. It's done through the right side with a small working port of about two to three centimeters and and a few robotic um, ports. I can probably go back to site. I don't know if they can see the slides anymore. So you get a small uh, two to three centimeter working port right here, and then three uh, robotic arms that go in. Those are about seven, eight millimeters in, in diameter. And then two of these will be used for a chest tube at the end. So basically with three incisions and a two centimeter incision in the groin for cannulation. It's done through the right side. We, we have to have relatively untouched right hemithorax. So if you had a lobectomy or pleurodesis for pneumothorax, or you've had multiple uh, sternotomies, uh, they usually have violated the right chest uh, uh, cavity, and, and there will be significant adhesion. So that precludes uh, it. It precludes it, yeah. Okay, and then lastly, um, you know, th this is a minimally invasive approach to repairing the mitral valve. Uh, we would be remiss not to touch a little bit on percutaneous tri uh, mitral valve uh, repair or edge-to-edge -edge repair uh, because this avoids, you know, open heart surgery. It's through the groin. Um, and so what would you say to uh, a patient who says, look, I just want a catheter repair and someone who's a candidate for a robotic or, or steatotomy who says I want a catheter repair to repair my mitral valve because that is even more minimally invasive mm -hmm. and I leave the hospital the next day and I don't have to deal with incisions and, and all of that. I'll tell them to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, well, as you obviously know, the, 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 the transcatheter uh, H2H repair is a non-anatomical repair. Mm -hmm. uh, now, open or robotic surgery is anatomical, so your valve will look like a normal valve at the end of the procedure. Uh, with the h 2 edge repair, you make an, a, a normal mitral valve into double orifice valve. You potentially can increase the gradient across it. Uh, it's usually reserved for high-risk patients, uh, patients who are not a surgical candidate, uh, and, and you just want to get them a, a better uh, regurgitation than, than potentially severe. And, and again, as you no, many of these, the goal is not to eliminate the mitral valve regurgitation, it's to reduce it from severe to moderate or hopefully mild. Mm. With, with surgery, you know, if anything is more than mild, you'll be coming after me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, that will be my suggestion. This will be reserved for high risk patients. High risk uh, or private risk. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we want to be uh, mindful of everyone's time. It's uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this uh, uh, webinar. And I'd like to thank my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Agarmi, for sharing all the uh, knowledge and expertise on uh, mitral valve repair. And I'd um, like to thank you for uh, joining us. And please uh, join us again uh, next month for another, another webinar.
Thank you. Great.